Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And what we're going to be talking about this week, Bob, is working with parental interjects in the therapy process. I love this topic. Oh, well, leading up to Christmas, I've got a lot to say about it, by the way. But... um... And I do like your jumper for people on the YouTube. <laughs> it says Holly Jolly Xmas. <laughs> for, <laughs> for people who are just on Spotify or a podcast, you've, you're really missing a treat. But you can over, go over to Bob Cook YouTube channel and you can actually see the visual, the actual visual um, representation of the jumper. Lovely. Which I'm sure will really fill you full of Christmas cheer. Because we need to get into the Christmas spirit. It's been one of those years again, Bob, hasn't it? But we're coming up to the end of 2023. God, can you... I can't believe it. I've only just got used to writing 2023 as the date and now it's going to be 2024. (laughs) I can't believe it. Can't believe it. Anyway, so what do you love about this subject then? This seems to come up an awful lot in my therapy sessions with people, that internal dialogue and that internal voice, you know, yeah. People refer to it as those voices in my head a lot of the time. Yeah, those voices either giving you permissions. Generally the opposite. <laughs> or so can because they've usually come to therapy. Yeah. Um, giving negative messages. Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And... When we look at resilience, by the way, the development of resilience, I think what we're talking about is very much in this ballpark. Because one of the aspects of developing resilience, I know the podcast is not on developing resilience, I think is helping the client be aware of the negative internalized messages and then helping the client make connection with what would develop resilience instead of the annihilation of self-esteem which is what toxic messages do um and what will help you know a more resilient person if you like is positive narratives where people are kind on themselves and actually have a compassionate you know compassionate narrative yeah um from a significant other person which they can internalize in place if you like yeah toxic now and that will help build up resilience so then don't feel so overwhelmed absolutely I love the way that you put that Bob because that that's what it's all about is that awareness for me is the key the first step is to notice that voice because often we it's it's been there for that long we don't really pay much attention to it we don't notice it's there we just get the feeling and the message of negativity from it so here's here's something I want to ask you as a professional therapist. How do you help a person be aware of the negative dialogue amongst that general chatter uh, that they hear inside their, you know, neurological processes? For me, one of the things I say an awful lot with clients is to just slow the thoughts down. <clears throat> that to me is the first step to being aware of it is to notice the thoughts and to slow them down and I usually say something to them like whose voice is it because I maybe I don't know what goes on in other people's heads but, but in mine I hear my voice in my head you know when I'm thinking I hear the thoughts but then there's another voice that doesn't belong to me that's going on as well so it's noticing which thoughts are mine and which aren't mine, which are those parental interjects. And it's always negative with me. So when you say slow the sort of tape down, if you like. Yeah. Um, if I thought of that in practical terms, what would they be doing to slow down their thought process? 
I get them to challenge those thoughts. How? I talk about taking the thoughts to court. First of all, you've you've got to you've got to notice them. Yes. It's That's the it. feeling that they get with the thinking. I think is the first thing that often is picked up on. So feeling angry, frightened, stressed. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Just that negative feeling, you know, I, the, the what ifs and I can't do that, I'm not good enough, all those sort of scenarios. So what do you mean by taking the, the negative dialogue to court? Because that's a really interesting expression I've not heard before. I just get them to challenge it. <coughs> if you're oh, saying things like I'm not good enough, mm. then kind of challenge that thought and take it to court and find of you know examples where you have been good enough and you have achieved it and you have done it, rather than just taking it as reality. Mm. What a wonderful concept. Well, thank you. <laughs> I can't really do it. And do you find that it works? It certainly gives them food for thought. It, 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 it's heightening them noticing the dialogue that they have got. And because maybe, I think a lot of this is done out of awareness. We don't even notice those thoughts. No, I was thinking of a client who, um, if she got, if she got bad news, you know, one day, then bad news the second day and bad news the third day, she'd be so overwhelmed that the overwhelmingness led to negative catastrophe, catastrophization yeah. in her thinking. And the negative catastrophization in her thinking or negative dialogue would mean she felt even more overwhelmed yeah. and then she'd have a uh, sort of mini collapse and take time off work. Yeah. And I think that's what I mean by slow it down so that that chain reaction doesn't happen of one thing leading to another to another and then getting overwhelmed. If we can slow it down and challenge that thinking, then we've got the opportunity to to do something different. I think it's interesting, the, and I think it has what happens with a lot of clients that I used to say, see, where almost quick as a flash, if that, is that the right? Yeah, very quick anyway. Yeah. They went into negative thinking from feeling overwhelmed. Yes. So they'd feel overwhelmed with the bad news, say, or whatever it is, and they go straight into negative thinking and catastrophizing. Yeah. And that leads to feeling even more hopeless then that leads to feeling anxious, then that leads to more hopelessness, and then there's a collapse. Absolutely, yeah. So that's slowing down right at the beginning when they fear, hear the bad news and they start to feel uh, overwhelmed and go into negative thinking. That's when it needs to be challenged. It's like, well, what's the positive side of this? I can choose to go to negative thinking or I could actually do something else. Yeah. And knowing I, that there is a choice, that we don't need to do <clears throat> that chain reaction right to the end. We can stop it at any point when we're when we're aware of it. And That's where do you think this comes from? This I, I hear this in so many clients you see over my 30 odd years. So where do you think this pattern we're talking about actually uh, where's the origin come from? From our primary caregivers when we're growing up, whoever that might be. <laughs> so so this is the podcast we're talking about, of course, yeah. is um, they've taken on that pattern. Yeah, if you like. the beliefs and values and, and everything, really. Yeah. One of their caretaker figures. Yeah. So they either hear their caretaker figures in their head negatively, yeah, or they've got them, or they've got a model of that behaviour, or both. Yes, yeah, yeah, and it, it, it I think it, you know, for, for some, it often feels like it's actually part of them. It's part of their DNA. You know that they've not inherited it, <clears throat> picked it up. That it is actually part of of who they are. Mm -hmm. When the reality is often it's not. 
Do you think mindfulness would be help would help in the slowing down bit for your talking? Yeah. yeah, being in the here and now. You, you know, often I think we with these, you know, parental interjects, there's a lot of predicting the future goes with it do you know what I mean well if I do that x y and z is going to happen when the reality is we don't know if we can be in the here and now and practice mindfulness like you said that gives us the opportunity to actually explore the thoughts that's all and I think one of the keys here for this podcast and what you've just said is you know the question it, whose negative thoughts could they be mm. And have we got different options instead of taking them on? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think there's learned behaviour involved in that as well? You know, like the, the nature-nurture debate that's always going on. That you, do you know what I mean? If if you've got quite a negative parent that's anxious and, and gets overwhelmed and catastrophizes, it's all part and parcel of it. Yes, that's what I meant by the question, Hugh. Um, definitely learned behaviour. Yeah. Definitely. And often often people have uh different types of parenting. So one parent could be the way we just talked about. Yeah. Another parent could be another way, which could be equally negative, but might have a positive part to it, uh that they've actually could utilize but haven't done for some reason. Yes. I suppose, you know, the reality of having two parents that yeah. are quite different, there will be one that overpowers the other in a physical sense as we're growing up. So that, you know, the two voices in our heads, so to speak, is probably quite the same. Oh. You know, for me, one of my parents was really risk averse and the other one was a really big risk taker. So there's, yeah. I've got two completely different parts of me. Mm. one that's kind of very gung-ho and yes I can do it and then there's another one that goes oh I don't think we should be doing that <laughs> and the skill at the end of the day is to find your own exactly own yeah thoughts, I mean yes that is what I think therapy is really good for is to work out what parts are working and what parts aren't <laughs> mm -hmm. and I think TA is particularly good for this yeah because they have the concept of script yes yeah uh, in other words, they have the concept uh, uh, that we take on a blueprint, if you like, uh, from our significant other people. And we follow that blueprint or the decisions that we've made in making up the blueprint yeah. um, as an attempt to cope or survive in life, which in TA they call script. Yes. Uh, yeah. People come to therapy really to <clears throat> understand that blueprint understand who they are and if it's not working for them to find a way to find their own blueprint yeah not I... an easy job but that's no but no VA is quite use quite i think useful as an and, a, and an accessible model if you like um to help a person do that yeah I think, you know, one of the, the important things for me is kind of when we realise that we have got this internal dialogue that's going on is to differentiate our voice from it. And do you know what I mean? To kind of identify it and so that we can then observe it as opposed to actually feeling like it's us, if that makes sense. No, I, I totally agree. And I think that... Um, somebody taught me a long time ago that the therapist needs to be more potent than that negative parent voice. Yeah. Now, for the therapist listens, people who's listening to this podcast and maybe have a different view, in other words, staying behind the client and um, not stepping in or whatever frame we want to come from. Um, I'm not saying I disagree with that. But what I am saying is that I think it's useful for the therapist to have a more potent voice 
than the negative internalized parent that the person's often adopted yeah me too particularly in a therapeutic setting it's mm. kind of like somebody's got your back <laughs> you're not in the fight on your own i think when you've got a potent therapist mm. Mm. yeah and uh in ta they have the idea of um what's called a parent interview where you might um ask the client to, to role play or yeah. be that internalized negative parent even if it's only for a few minutes mm. and the therapist would have a dialogue with the internalized parent to find out or help find out what it's all about yeah in other words how come they're being that way with their son or daughter which i think is really powerful i've, I've observed that being done in my you know when that the training or whatever and it was really powerful mm. Mm. i mean the trick in that of course is that the therapist really needs to avoid getting into competition with the internalized parents and they need to they need to find a way to come alongside the vulnerable part of the parent mm. because that's where the negative script will have come from yeah yeah it's an extension of what we did a podcast on actually years ago a long two time chair ago work. 15 or 20 which was two chair, two yeah. chair work where you they go backwards and forwards from two parts of themselves yeah absolutely mm. I'm going off soon to teach some therapists in Ljubljana, which is part of Slovenia. On, I'm going to do a demonstration of a parent interview and then teach off it. Wow. And they are extremely powerful. The, the, the technique, I mean. Absolutely, yeah. It helps the, most more than, more than anything else. It helps empower the client, this technique. But as as important it helps them differentiate out from their own voice and whose parents voice they're actually hearing yeah yeah and then th there's there's something about it, it do you know what i mean being able to to reframe that or to replace that negative dialogue with a, a more positive self-dialogue i suppose <laughs> Yeah, so I think the therapist needs to use nurturing, nurturing channel. Yeah, increased empathy to contact the vulnerable child, and to get to um, a negative dialogue, if you like. Now, interestingly enough, um, even in the most dysfunctional families, usually somewhere you'll find a positive internalized voice could be the grandmother yeah grandfather could be a cousin could be an older sibling you will find that somewhere um it could be even father christmas given what we're talking about yeah. here yeah 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 the absent parent or the absent person yeah or the, or the fantasy father Christmas. In other words, what the client desired would happen. But actually perhaps never did. Yeah. Do you think as therapists were in there somewhere? Uh, at a later oh, date? <laughs> if, they, if they're not, find another therapist. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, because if the therapist isn't, modeling a different type of internalized significant other person then what will happen is the continuation of the old blueprint so the internalization of of, of positive role models doesn't just happen 
like when we're forming our script, this this is like a lifelong thing that people that influence us or that are a positive yeah. have a positive effect on us throughout our life are kind of internalized. Yeah. So I met Richard Erskine when I was 35. I'm now 73 next week. I'm 73, so it's like a long time. And he played a very important part in a lot of my professional development as a very important mentor. Yeah. As you are with me, Bob. You're in me somewhere. <laughs> very much. But I was thinking in your job, you know, when you're fostering. Yes. Yeah. This is a good example of what we're talking about. Um, you will provide and I'm a very important um, interjected positive ever for those people, oh. those kids growing yeah. up. To be yeah, I'd like to think so. One actually mm. knocked yeah. on my door last week, which was lovely. <laughs> yeah. And how many times do you hear people say, oh, that person had a really positive uh, impact on my life. Uh, that person will never realise I, I took this first job at XXX and they showed me the way round and they took me under their wing and in fact I was just listening to this today somebody who um was a footballer talking about his first coach yeah who took him under his wing and helped him develop his football skills and 10 years 20 years later they still remember those kind words yeah which counteracts the the, the negative bias or that, that negative internal dialogue that we have a lot of the time, which is good. I mm. like it when there's hope. <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's not like this happens to us and there's nothing that we can do about it. When we're aware oh. of all this psychological stuff, then we've got the choice to do something about it moving forward. Yeah, I think that's one of the most important parts of going into therapy. Yeah. Is we can develop different options and choices enhance our life and take ownership and destiny of a new way of being absolutely yeah that's the a really important part of therapy i think and uh, you need a powerful potent nurturing positive therapist who will be more powerful than those negative interjects that people my clients often with their lives yeah yeah it's it's true that and and you know being important enough to challenge that negative parental interject when it does rear its ugly head <laughs> i think it's important to therapists does that yeah often uh, um, a, a method i developed a lot and used was I would talk to the parent as if they were in the room. Mm. Say, look, I hear you talking like that, and I don't believe that is actually um, what X is saying. How come you're being so negative with your son and daughter here? Please, I don't want you to be like that. And if you're going to continue like that, I want you to leave this room. And that, I would imagine for your client is so powerful. Yeah, they may never challenges. Heard that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Right. They may never have heard that before, or even believe that was possible. Yeah. So you talk to the parent as if they're the third person in the room. Which they are. <laughs> they are. <laughs> so therefore <laughs> the therapist could do it, couldn't they? Yes. If yeah. they thought about it that way. Yeah. Somebody once said to me, it might have actually been your darling wife, Steph, mm. um, Steffi, that, you know, it's like an amphitheater sometimes. There's that many people in the therapy room. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's, there's our parents and our parents' parents and their parents and everybody. And it's like there is a massive amphitheater of ancestors that are in there with us. Well, so we must make sure that the client takes the spotlight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I like that. Not gets and not <laughs> continues to get buried under the avalanche of all these figures. Yeah, that's the positive, yeah. empowering part yeah. of therapy. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of times, you know, especially 
I found out in assessments, but I knew before, of course, um, do of what do a lot of what they call overthinking. Mm. And in the overthinking, they do what you started to talk about 25 minutes ago, which is what I call negative catastrophization. Yeah. They go to if I if this happens because of that happens, because of this happens, then this could happen. And before they know where they are, they're in the past. Yeah. Talking just like they did when I was a kid. Yeah. Yeah. I survive the actions that might follow from their negative parents or attempt to take some control over the neg in the process. So if I do this because of that, because of this, and underneath it is a, de a desire to take control so they can get a successful outcome. Absolutely. Survival mechanism. Yeah. If I can control this, if I can work out every scenario, <laughs> Yeah. then I'll know what to do when it happens. Yeah, and yeah. I'll be safe. Absolutely, yeah. I think that's the crux of 99% of my clients at the moment is that, you know, having a thought and kind of bringing it to life and making a story around it, that then it becomes a thing and it's it grows legs. It's kind of got its own entity. Oh, oh. Yeah. It's exhausting, though. Absolutely. It's tiring. Yes. It's overwhelming. Absolutely. And can lead and can lead to depression. Yeah. Anxiety, a feeling of hopelessness and a justified collapse. Yeah. And the the interesting thing is that it's not reality, Bob. <laughs> All well, it's that's... reality we create, isn't it? It it feels that the feelings are real that comes with it. Oh. But we've created this this reality from our thoughts, from that internal interject or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. And, and what happens, of course, we, we regress yes. to a younger style of thinking. Yeah. And in that process of a younger style of thinking, we are able to see the adult reality of choices. Yeah. We move to a place of limited options. Yeah. And then we overwhelm ourselves and all these things I've just said. We're their ugly head. Yeah. Which is worth for me, if we can slow all that down and get back into our logical thinking and in our adult, then we can make better decisions and better choices. Absolutely. Yeah. And I still think the trick is what we talked about right at the beginning of this podcast. When I asked you what you mean by slow you know, what is the practical implications of slowing down? The first step, I think, and you said it anyway, is to be aware that you are overthinking, mm. to be aware that you're not the negative thought. Yes. Be aware that you do have options. Yeah. And then you said, well, one big signal would be feelings. Mm. And I agree with you. And there are often feelings in the body. Yes, absolutely. They're, they're tight stomach. Yeah. Or they're tight calf muscles. Or they're a headache. Yeah. All these things are signals of this process we're talking about. Yeah. And again, it, it's it's being aware of those changes when they're happening. You know, they, they, they happen so subtly and out of our awareness that we're kind of 50% in it before we even realise what's going on. Mm. And it's mm. habitual as well. For me, I think it's habitual behaviour. Whenever I've got a decision to make, it's often habitual stuff I go through. You do. And in TA Today, which is a basic TA book by Ian Stewart and Van Joins, and it's got many editions right up to date. It doesn't really matter what edition you buy, but what I'm going to say now. Um, one is a good textbook of learning, a personality model to help you in what we're talking about. But also in the back of that book, is a wonderful poem. I can't remember who's by Nelson Portia, I think, where she talks about, uh, or they talk about how, as the person stop, how can I explain this? Starts to take charge of this process and take on a new script. They won't take the same road. Yeah. Again. Yeah. It's a process. It's actually a process, really. Yeah, absolutely. There's six chapters to it, six verses to it. But you might find yourself going down the same road. 
the first step is to be aware that you are going down that road. Yeah. Then you go down that road again and you realize that you are actually going down that road. Yeah. Then you can realize maybe I can go down another road. Yeah. And then you go, might don't go down that road. And then you see a big hole in the road and you fall in. Yeah. And then you realize, well, maybe I can get out of that hole. And you get out of the hole, go down another road, still see the same hole fall in it but this time you don't stay in the hole so long yeah you get out quicker go down another road which in fact has no hole in it at all yeah but it's a process not an event absolutely i love that poem yeah ta today good book to learn to transaction analysis yes that poem is in the uh, that whole poem is in the back of that book yeah and it, is, it describes it perfectly, I think, the awareness. And then, you know, we do the behaviour. Then we're aware that we're doing the behaviour. Then we have a choice to change the behaviour. And then we do something different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, because I can often find myself uh, going to default patterns mm -hmm. that perhaps I haven't changed. But this time around, through a lot of therapy and through a lot of age and many other things, I get out much quicker. And yeah. go down another road yeah it's, i think for me it's knowing when i'm in it now i know when i'm in my script and sometimes i'm in that much of a funk i want to be in my script and other times i step straight out of it but it all depends where i am in that moment but the thing is you've got awareness and choice haven't you jackie absolutely yeah and that's thanks to therapy and yourself going to therapy i met somebody today for an assessment and uh, they had so much social anxiety, they uh, couldn't get out of the house. And, um, you know, you could say social phobia, if you like. But she'd managed to pick up the phone and she'd managed to get out of the house and managed to come to the therapy room and managed to see me. And I thought, oh, you know, whatever you achieve in therapy, it was you that took the first step. Absolutely. And it's for you to do the therapy. That's not discounting the importance of the therapist but there's two of them yeah well done to them mm. i love it when i hear stories like that bob <laughs> yeah it's humble this profession is very humbling i think it certainly is it certainly is so thank you for that um so what we're going to be talking about next time is what are the most successful elements in the therapy process great and it's the last one i think before christmas isn't it it is the last one, the penultimate one of this year. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I like telling a story. I'm going to do it. I might go overboard. It might take it two minutes more. Um, I I used to have a place, a uh, home in Gambia, uh, which is in West Africa, which is near Senegal. And uh, we stopped going about, well, when my daughter was about 12, uh, we stopped going for lots of different reasons. But I wasn't when we went the first time. And I had to get used to the poverty, extreme poverty there. Um, and I remember coming back and I said to Steph, my wife, next Christmas when we came, because we came most Christmases, I'm going to bring a wonderful Christmas dinner with sprouts, turkey, roast potatoes, stuffing, apple and i'm going to put some sixpences in and i'm going to bring a wonderful um christmas cake and i'm going to bring it so they they can really feast because that's you know because they've never starving and my, my wife looked at me as if i was mad and she said you can't do that bob and i said well i'd like to do it i mean they'll be able to have a feast won't they and she said, well, their stomachs are so small mm. and shrunk, they'll be sick. Yeah. And that's a metaphor for therapy. In other words, if you um, feed people too fast, when you talk about sequences of therapy, which are going to this podcast, yeah, they'll be sick. So yeah. therapy is a process, never an event. And it needs to be, Bob. I think, yeah, 
they, they does. And the, the the older I'm getting and the more experience I'm getting, it's it's so much better. It's like a fine wine if it's just left to mature and age over time rather than, you know, these you can have massive shifts in a short space of time, which is brilliant. But you've got to integrate it. Absolutely. But point, for the deeper longevity of it, it needs to take the time. Yeah. Be a good place to start the next podcast, what we're just talking about. <laughs> we better stop then, Bob. <laughs> yeah. See you next week then. So until next time. Speak soon, Bob. Bye bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show Behind Closed Doors Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.